here. All right, so, uh, okay, the opinion paper, I'm gonna talk about that briefly, uh, and then we'll get rolling because we got a lot of ground to cover because I am uh, way behind. So, um, the opinion paper. Um, there are two films that are going to, that are linked up right now. So the opinion paper is a simple uh, project. There are three things that you are graded on, three. Um, so the two films uh, are both factually accurate. Um, they're about the decisions to drop the bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They have um, different sets of evidence but both sets of evidence are factually correct. So you don't have to worry about trying to decipher uh, whether or not something is uh, accurate. Uh, they're both accurate, but they have quite different perspectives on the United States decision. And so they tacitly reach different conclusions, right? Um, a, a thing about the first film, as I said uh, on the first day of class, uh, I am uh, unable to gain full access to the film uh, for some uh, YouTube copyright uh, uh, problem, and our university cannot get it in a virtual format, although they do now own it um, in a uh, DVD format. Uh, so um, there's that. So um, the, the Victory in the Pacific, it's a two-hour episode of the American Experience series. We watch the second hour. Uh, and the second hour is broken up into segments that are linked on Blackboard. One of those segments, about 13 minutes of it, uh, is blocked by some sort of copyright issue. And so you, you can watch the first couple segments and then uh, it's a blank segment that says, you know, this video has been removed. So what I have in lieu of that missing section is the transcript from the episode. So you can watch the first couple seconds, uh, sections stop, read the transcript um, that is posted, then pick up and watch the remainder of the video. It's really not ideal, uh, but I can't figure out a way to get around it. And I'm not, uh, I was not impressed with the other films I could have used in that slot. This film really does a nice job of what I wanted to do. Uh, so we have to work around it. The second film, White Light, Black Rain is an HBO uh, documentary, which we do have access through the library. So you have the full access to this film. The film's about an hour and 35, an hour and 40. We watch about the first hour, right? So uh, together, those two films comprise the assignment for the opinion paper. So the three things you are graded on, number one, your ability to talk about the two films and the evidence they present. Number two, the evidence uh, or the, uh, the things that have led you to your opinion, right? So in viewing these two films, right, with the information they have, evaluating their evidence, then you craft your own opinion on the decision. But you have to be able to justify why, you're, why you've reached that opinion. Number three, simple uh, grammar and editing things, right? So there's no right answer to this opinion paper. It's your opinion, but you're graded on your ability to provide support for your opinion. The paper can be written with just the information in the class, right? So there's nothing uh, you have to do outside the class. However, if you do want to supplement the information from the film with outside sources, that's perfectly fine. All I require is that you provide a source citation when you use outside sources, right? Five pages, double space, you know, uh, normal font size. Uh, I use Times New Roman 12. Uh, I'm not really hung up on what particular font you use, uh, but something comparable to that. Um, and uh, the dude, uh, you need to submit it to Safe Assignment. And there's a link on Safe Assignment that I already have on there, but I'll move it to the top. Uh, so uh, on Blackboard so that you can access it easily. Uh, submit your paper uh, just like you do the exams, right? Due date is Wednesday, May 5th. That's when I'd like you to have it in, but you don't lose points if you're a little bit after that. Uh, I will need to have it before I turn in grades if you want to grade for this semester. All right, uh, questions? Anyone?
Everything is crystal clear. Did everybody hear me? Is yes. Void? I think it makes sense. Okay. All right. Onward and upward then. Okay. So, um, where we left off uh, was talking about um, the midterm elections. Now, the midterm elections are uh, contrary to the truism that the party in power will lose some support. Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the Democratic Party had another huge victory, right? But there's a catch. These Democrats that are elected are a lot uh, further to the political left than Franklin Delano Roosevelt is. So this is going to put pressure on Franklin Delano Roosevelt to adopt more radical solutions, right? So I have asserted, so it must be true uh, that the first 100 days is not fundamentally radical with one and a half exceptions. What are those? Anyone? Alfred, you're on my screen. Why is that? Uh, why is what are the two one and a half radical elements of the first hundred days? Uh, I know one of them was the Tennessee Valley Authority because it created uh, like a, a a an energy supplier run by the United States government rather than a private corporation. Okay, so is that radical in the United States history? Yes, because it's the it's kind of the first time that the government has directly competed with sure. private the government. Industries. The government's creating an in, a business to create and sell hydroelectric power in competition with private industry. They're selling it, right? That that's radical in American history. Madison, what's the half radical element? Was it the banking deal? The banking was unusual and unprecedented. Uh, but it's not fundamentally radical because it doesn't seek to um, change the idea of private private banks, right? Doesn't move the government um, into, you know, they're going to run your branch office, right? That would be a radical change, but the Banking Act uh, doesn't do that. The other part that I thought was radical um, was uh, the amount of bills that he did pass in the first day so quickly. Again, unprecedented, but I wouldn't necessarily call it radical, right? Unprecedented for sure, but not radical, just a, a, the normal process in an accelerated timeline. Um, how, does the, how had historically the nation felt about unions? Uh, um, the government didn't step in until uh, Roosevelt and they started playing a bigger role in allowing it was the um the, what bill was it uh, which roosevelt are we talking about uh franklin okay um, what what had historically with oh, this clause 7a right so what does <laughs> clause 7a do what makes uh, it radical it protected the workers right to unionize and imposes fines Okay, who authorizes and protects that? The government. Which government? Federal government. Yeah. <laughs> Federal government, right? So you need to be clear on, on this on some cases, right? So if you're talking about Jim Crow legislation, you don't want to say the government because most Jim Crow legislation came from state and local areas, right? So you need to be a little bit more precise just in identifying when you say the government, right? So here we're talking about the federal government. The federal government has shifted its position from uh, being generally opposed to uh, workers forming unions as radical activity, and the government had historically served as the strike breaker of last resort. It had sided with business owners against workers and their union efforts. Now with subclause 7a, it's moving the government from um, siding with the business owners beyond just being neutral to the government is saying the workers have the right. 
They're authorized and protected in their right to form a union. This is a radical idea in United States history at that time, right? Uh, so that is the one half because it's only subclause 7A of a much larger bill. All right, so the 1934 election is more radical. And I, uh, I will tell you that Franklin Delano Roosevelt is a masterful politician, right? And one thing uh, sharp politicians recognize, there's an old joke that politicians have. They say, if you see a bunch of people uh, marching down the street in a direction, go get in front of them because then people will think you're leading them, right? And so for Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his party and the public have favored more radical action. And so Franklin Delano Roosevelt, sharp politician decides, well, he's gonna uh, promote some more radical ideas too. Along with that, two elements along with that. One, in the first 100 days, Franklin okay. Delano Roosevelt had actively sought to partner with business, right? He had been very solicitous of uh, business interest and wanted to ensure that things were being done with business, right? But that um, uh, idea of relying upon business was not met by business owners or, or uh, the business class with political support. In the 1934 election, the uh, business owners funded and supported Republicans, Republicans who were vowing to undo uh, what Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the Democrats were doing, right? So this partnership with uh, business had not achieved anything for Franklin Delano Roosevelt's political interests and the interests of the Democrats. So he's less inclined to be a partner. But it's also important to recognize that now we're into, uh, after the 1934 election, now we're into 1935, the depression has not been resolved. These efforts of the first 100 days ha have made an impact in lessening the misery of the Great Depression, but they hadn't solved the Great Depression. So these emergency stopgap measures um, that uh, marked many of the ideas of the first 100 days uh, are things that Franklin Delano Roosevelt is now reconsidering. And so uh, suddenly, abruptly, in the summer of 1935, Franklin Delano Roosevelt issues a call for another emergency session. It's called the second hundred days, right? Um, first hundred days lasted exactly a hundred days. Second hundred days, it depends on when you start counting. If you start from um, when the, the con congressional session began, it's 236 days. If you count from uh, when the extension went, it's 75 days, right? But it's another emergency session. Congress was wrapping up its normal session of business and getting ready to go in the recess. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt abruptly said, I need you to keep working, right? And he says, um, there is five must pieces of legislation that the Congress must deal with to deal with this continual disaster uh, of the economy, right? Chris, Chris, please, it's down here. So one of the things that triggered this um, action was a Supreme Court ruling. Uh, Jet Siri, how does one get on the Supreme Court? You said, how does one go into the Supreme Court? Yeah, how do you get on the Supreme Court? What's the process? Um, the president has to elect you to be in the Supreme Court. He elects you? Um, uh, he doesn't elect, he chooses you to be- He nominates you. Nominates, yeah. Right? Uh, and does that get you on the court or is there a step in between? I think that gets you into the court. No, there's a step in between. The step in between is it has to, you have to be uh, voted in by the Senate, right? Oh. So you're nominated by the president, but you're appointed by the Senate. Right, they vote on your nominee. And how long are you on the court? What's your term? Um, it's a lifetime unless you uh, die or retire. Okay, good. Or are convicted of treason, right? So getting on the Supreme Court is a lifetime appointment. Uh, and within that Supreme Court, right, there's nine members of the Supreme Court then and now. Um, 
The nine members of the Supreme Court are appointed by presidents and ratified by the Senate. So they are, uh, presidents don't nominate people that don't reflect their particular political orientation or uh, view of the, the legal components of the Constitution. And they still have to pass the Senate, right? So there is the, you know, the people, the presidents who nominate them and the senates that ratify them, right? There is, it's part of this political process. So it's reflective of a variety of different viewpoints. So that's a long way to get around to this simple point. The court is made up of justices that range along the political spectrum from a more left or liberal interpretation of the constitution to a more conservative view of the constitution. That's the, the court is not, um, a monolith of one point of view, it's made up of a spectrum, right? Uh, and the spectrum is reflective of the people who nominate them and the senates that ratify them. So um, all Supreme Court rulings are equal. So Jetsiri, you're gonna remain my Supreme Court uh, scholar. If the Supreme Court rules something five to four, is it, uh, rules something unconstitutional five to four, what happens to that particular piece of uh, thing under examination? Uh, it doesn't get passed. Well, again, we need to be precise in our oh. language, right? So passage of legislation comes from the Congress, the legislative branch, and the executive signs it, right? Or it overrides his veto. So it's not about passing legislation. What's it about? If the Supreme Court rules something unconstitutional, what happens to that law? Um, doesn't it get like, it just doesn't pass through and it just stopped at the Supreme Court. Okay, well, so what happens to it? What does it mean when the Supreme Court stops it? It's not a law. The Supreme oh, yeah. Court has thrown it out, right? Has said, this does not pass constitutional muster because the job of the Supreme Court is to rule on the constitutionality of things, legislation being the primary component, right? So if it's the Supreme Court rules, this law is in violation of the constitution because we have this hierarchy where at the top is the uh, constitution, the basic rule book of the nation, right? You can't pass laws that violate the rule book. So the rule book throws them out or the interpreters of the rule book, the Supreme Court throws them out. So throwing them out means they're no longer the law of the land, right? Because the Supreme Court has said this does not pass constitutional muster. So five to four, Supreme Court throws a, a ruling out. What happened, a law out, what happens to it? Doesn't become law. It doesn't become law, right? How about six to three? Is it more or less constitutional if it's six to three? Uh, less constitutional? Well, uh, or is it thrown is the out six of that? Is the six the approving and three the? Six, six saying it's unconstitutional, three saying it's constitutional. Oh, it's unconstitutional. And, and about seven to two? Uh, unconstitutional. Eight to one unconstitutional nine to zero unconstitutional okay so all supreme court rulings are equal a five to four declares something unconstitutional a nine to zero declares unconstitutional so formally it's not any different right but in reality a five to four ruling means that five supreme court justices said it was unconstitutional but four said it was right so that's a close ruling. So if for whatever reason, one of the justices changed their mind, then it can become four or five and can be constitutional. If one of these justices dies, right? And is replaced by somebody um, with a different viewpoint, then a similar bill could be five to four constitutional. So five to four suggests that four members of the Supreme Court thought it was constitutional, right? So all Supreme Court rulings are equal but some are more equal than others, right? 
a nine to zero ruling says, yeah, not even close. All parts of the political spectrum on the Supreme Court, the most liberal justice and the most conservative justice have said, this is unconstitutional and thrown it out, right? It means that, you know, there's not any wiggle room about this being changed. Nine to zero rulings are important, not only because they have the same effect of ruling something uh, unconstitutional or constitutional, depending on what they rule, but it also means that the court is speaking in one voice. We're gonna see that again uh, next week when we talk about Brown versus Board of Education, right? So I'm kind of giving up the game about Brown versus Board of Education's ruling, but that process tells us something, right? So in a nine to zero ruling that was announced in uh, the uh, late winter of 1935, so we're still in the first 100 days, right? Or I mean, the, excuse me, the first term of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, his first term as president, um, that announcement threw out the National Industrial Recovery Act. And so, and when the way the bill was written, uh, when it was thrown out, it took everything with it, including subclause 7A. So that, that radical change in how the government views unions or the rights of workers to unionize has been pitched out, right? So abruptly, with very little warning, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, then um, uh, is, issues his five must rulings, right? So in the background, we have this issue of the court, which has thrown out subclause 7A. And as part of his five must rulings, he creates, um, I'm gonna talk about them in sort of reverse order, right? Uh, so the first one is a banking bill that he calls a must. Congress must deal with these. And what he's saying is I want you to pass them. And the banking bill is the continual uh, control of the banking sector by the federal government, a more um, intrusive oversight rule, uh, role in banking, right? Um, there is a public utilities bill which breaks up public utilities which are held in a trust, right? And so it says these trusts, which are sort of a, a, a series of shell companies that ostensibly are competing, but actually are owned by a small number of shareholders, right? Creating monopolies. So uh, the public uh, utilities bill says break them up. There is a soak the rich tax bill, right? Soak the rich. A soaking means to put, um, in this case, it means put a higher rate of taxation on it, right? So this soak the rich tax bill, what does this kind of, kind of sound like? Giving or putting higher rates of taxation on the wealthy and uh, corporations. Sydney, what does that kind of sound like that we've seen before? I'm not really sure what it matches with. It's really right. just like, yeah. What is the program that Huey Long is proposing that is very popular? You want to help Sydney out? Um, wasn't it share the wealth? Good. What does that mean? Like taxing the wealth. At what level? Uh, what percentage? It, um, 75. W what percentage? Was it people that made over $350,000? They taxed it and distributed it to those okay. in poverty. So, so tax, right? So we're talking to tax. What level of taxation above a certain income? 100%. 100%. That's radical. That's uh, Huey Long's proposal is, you know, nobody needs to make more than $250,000 a year, according to Huey. So anything above that, we're going to tax at 100%. We're going to take every penny they make above $250,000 and distribute it to the poor. Does that sound radical to you, Sydney?
What do you think? Yes, very radical. Yes, very radical, right? Huey's proposing an extremely radical taxation scheme, 100% taxation above a certain level. Uh, that has not happened in American history, right? So that level, a confiscatory level of taxation, that's radical, right? So what is this soak the rich tax scheme again, Sydney? Is it radical like that? Yes, it's very radical. No, it's not. Well, it's it's somewhat radical, right? Because it's proposing a higher level of taxation. But Franklin Delano Roosevelt is not claiming he's going to take every penny above a certain level, right? But Franklin Delano Roosevelt is a masterful politician. If a politician who's a competitor has an idea that's popular, a good idea is another politician is to you know try and steal some of the thunder by creating something like that, right? That's what soak the rich tax bill is, calling for increased levels, not 100%, but increased levels of taxation on uh, corporations and wealthy people. It's not radical like Huey's uh, program, but it is an elevated tax rate. And it's, it's, the idea is that it's gonna steal some of the support uh, that Huey's starting to generate, right? Um, it sounds much more radical than it becomes, right? Because what emerges from the Congress is watered down quite a bit, right? So instead of us soaking, um, you know, the wealthy and corporations maybe have a little bit higher rate of taxation. So it doesn't end up terribly radical. Uh, but the proposal of it uh, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt is designed to steal back some of the political support of people who are favoring the really radical program that Huey Long is promoting, right? Fourth, subclause 7A was pitched out with the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, subclause 7A got into the National Industrial Recovery Act because of um, Wagner from New York's staff who helped insert that language. Uh, Senator Wagner um, is promoting a standalone labor bill to protect the rights of workers, right? Abruptly, oh, and it was going nowhere in the Congress, right? But abruptly, Franklin Delano Roosevelt makes it one of his five musts, putting his political weight behind it. And the Wagner Labor Act is rapidly passed into law. I call the Wagner Labor Act subclause 7A on steroids because it's, it authorizes and protects the rights of uh, workers to form unions, right? So that language is, uh, is reborn in this standalone piece of legislation. But what's different is under the old uh, subclause 7A, um, the only penalty that uh, a company uh, could get for uh, violating the rights of workers to form unions, it was that theoretically they could take away their Blue Eagle, right? Which was a voluntary or a signal for voluntary support of that company. There was a little muscle behind it, right? Well, Wagner Labor Act, uh, it tries to achieve those same goals, but it brings with it an enforcement mechanism. And the enforcement mechanism is the language that business understands. They get fined. Right. So the Wagner Labor Act uh, copying um, the Labor uh, Relations Board, War Labor Relations Board that was part of the War Industries Board, creates a board to hear the complaints of workers and in theory of owners about their workers. Right. And this board will hear the evidence and then issue a ruling. And this ruling will carry with it an enforcement mechanism in the form of fines. So if businesses are found to be violating the rights of workers, now because of this new structure, the, um, the, the Wagner Labor Act will fine companies and take their money. This is a language that gets the attention of business owners, taking my money, right? And so the Wagner Labor Act, uh, it not only recreates 7A, but it also gives it greater, greater power. The final must piece of legislation is the Social Security Act. Social Security, um, you know, the United States was at that time the sole power, uh, industrial power on the planet 
who did not have some sort of social security plan, some sort of plan to provide for the retirement uh, of its uh, aged population, right? So something was coming down the pike, right? Germany had had a social security plan since 1870, right? But the United States still did not have one here in the 1930s. So something's coming down the pike. This plan is uh, the creation of an old age pension plan is designed to provide a floor beneath which um, the elderly uh, cannot sink, right? It was estimated at the time that 70% of the population 65 and older, older would be uh, labeled as in poverty, right? So the vast majority of the population 65 and older is enmeshed in poverty. This Social Security Act is designed to create a floor. And the way it works is, um, and this, you know, so some sort of social security program was coming, but the way it was funded is part of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's political genius, right? So Alfred, how is social security funded? Did I lose you, Alfred? Madison, how is social security funded? Um, through taxpayers. Okay, how does that work? Well, it um, comes from you and your employers. Okay, um, you're taxed, right? What is what is that? What is done with that money? Uh, it then goes to uh, a create pension for the government. So your money that you are taxed from is put away for you to use when you retire. Yes. No. Oh. Does well, anybody know how this works? Well, isn't it social security like if you like lose your job or if like if you're in an emergency and you need it? It it's a program to provide for um, primarily for the retirement, but it also has uh, uh, funds for um, people who are uh, on disability, right? So you're not able to work. The money doesn't is not collected from you and put aside. The money that you're paying in taxes, that I'm paying in taxes, that other everybody's paying in taxes for Social Security, and the, the people who employ you pay into this system as well, that money is used to fund the retirement of people right now. So your money is supporting the retirement of people 65 and older who are drawing Social Security, right? That's where your tax money is going. When you go to retire, Madison, or when I go to retire, my retirement is going to be paid by workers who may not even be born yet or haven't arrived in this nation yet. That system of taxing people now to fund the retirements of people now with the idea that when you get to retire, the people coming behind you are going to be paying your retirement. That's how Franklin Delano Roosevelt designed it, right? And he designed it with uh, his keen political eye, because he knew that if this was some, it's not, first off, it's not the most efficient means of taxation to, to generate funds. It's very regressive, meaning that people who earn less, the, the taxes they pay in social security takes a bigger bite as a percentage out of their income than it does a wealthier people, right? So that means that your tax impacts your budget a lot more than it does for D and her fabulous wealth that she gets uh, as a, a graduate student, right? The outrageous uh, salary she draws as graduate student, right? So the bite out of your budget is uh, felt deeper by people who make less money as part of this taxation, right? That's why it's called a regressive tax. It's not the most efficient means. Um, but it is politically durable. And that's what Franklin Delano Roosevelt understood, right? So this funding is something that means that everybody feels like they're paying into this system. If it was just a, a line on the tax uh, or, or on the federal budget, X amount of dollars from the funds from the federal government go to this, Franklin Delano Roosevelt knew that sometime in the future, some politician or political party could say, you know, we don't need this retirement stuff uh, for individuals. 
This should be something that they take care of themselves. The government should get out of this business, right? And so he knew that it would be easier for some future politician or political party or president to chip away at this retirement plan and so wear it away until it disappeared. But he thought it was crucially important. He, in fact, he thought of it as it was going to be his legacy and he's right. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt funded it in this way because he said, if people like Madison and Jatsuri and me uh, are paying into the system now, that when some politician says, we're gonna you know, phase out social security, that we'd be so furious that we'd vote that politician out. And the fear of arising or arousing the anger of the voters would prevent future politicians from uh, seeking to end this system of social security. And he's absolutely right. Social security is called the third rail of politics, touch it and you die. And politicians um, who are keen to be reelected have been loath to mess with social security because they fear the anger of people who say, I've been paying into the system for 20 years and now you wanna end it, right? Um, that fury, which would come out in the ballot box is what is the guarantee that social security continues. And that's what Franklin Delano Roosevelt understood, right? Now it's radical because the idea at the time was that you're responsible for your own uh, retirement, right? So in the abstract, this notion of rugged individualism, everybody's uh, responsible for their own retirement, which carries with it the flip side. If you're not prepared for your retirement, it's your own fault. Why didn't you plan ahead, right? Well, the reality of the uh, catastrophe of the uh, Great Depression reveals that there's many things that are out of your control. So uh, D has been diligently putting away, putting away her money for uh, her retirement in her bank. And then she goes to start withdrawing her retirement money and the bank has gone out of business. Well, D's out of luck, right? That doesn't mean that D hasn't been planning for her retirement it means of events out of her control. It could be the entire business cycle has collapsed, putting the banking sector under threat. So it's not even the banker's fault, or it could be bankers malfeasance, but nonetheless, D doesn't have a retirement fund, right? That's not her fault. Uh, somebody who works in a steel mill has been working their whole life the steel mill shuts down because the economy has collapsed and the, there's no uh, uh, full-time steel workers. And now that steel worker is forced to, to draw down their retirement funds. Uh, and then when things start to come back up because he's an older worker, he can't get hired, right? That's not his fault. So in the breach of the ideal, real, uh, ideal vision of everybody's responsible for their own retirement, and the reality of the world in which we inhabit, in which large scale things can upend the best, land, best laid plans of mice and men, right? The government is providing that low base level, right? And that's the thing, social security was seen as a floor beneath which you should not sink, right? It was not conceived of as your sole, sole means of retirement, but it was seen as something to keep uh, the population 65 and older uh, from having to resort to rooting around in garbage cans or eating cat food, right? That's what it's designed to do. And the way it's funded is part of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's genius. This second hundred days is more radical than the first, right? Part of what makes it more radical uh, is that instead of partnering with uh, businesses, this is now, um, you know, the government dictating the business. We're gonna break up public utilities because they're, they're forming a monopoly. We're going to enforce a social security plan to which business owners are gonna contribute to this fund. Um, we're going to uh, protect the, <coughs> the rights of workers to form unions, even though business owners don't want them to, right? So this is a more radical change uh, by Franklin Delano Roosevelt promoting this legislation in the second hundred days. We're still in the first term of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is the summer of 1935. 
Frank Delano Roosevelt elected in 1932, which means he's up for re-election in 1936, right? Um, Jet Siri, who is, uh, uh, well, actually Sally, um, who is the biggest threat politically to Frank Delano Roosevelt in 1936? <coughs> is he concerned about the Republican Party? Maybe you're stuck on mute there, Sally. What do you think, D? There it is. Okay. Oh, there you go. Go ahead. Well, Dee. he's concerned about the Supreme Court, right? About them overturning, like they have already done with the NRA and something else that they did a five four or whatever. Okay. So how about his election? Is he afraid the Supreme Court's not going to prevent his election? Right. No. So uh, is he afraid of the Republicans in his election? I don't think so, because he's got a really high approval rating right. from the people. Who might be a competitor for Franklin Delano Roosevelt then? Or what does he fear might be something that will upend his plans for re-election? I can't remember. How about Huey Long? Oh, well, yes, yes. Right. So, but, I mean, did people really? Well, never mind. Go ahead, go ahead, Sally. No. <laughs> go ahead. Did they really believe that that was possible? That uh, share the wealth plan? I mean, they certainly would want to believe it that we're going to take everything over two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. But they think that that was really going to happen. Sometimes, what you want to happen allows people to believe in fantasies in the political world. So um, to, to be fair, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is not worried about Huey Long beating him out for the Democratic nomination, right? Because the Democratic nomination is still largely controlled by the bosses in smoke-filled rooms, right? And Franklin Delano Roosevelt controls the Democratic Party, right? So um, they're not, a, he's not really afraid that Huey's going to beat him out for the Democratic nomination. What he fears is Huey will try, will fail, and then will break away and run as a third party candidate. And so as a third party candidate, he's gonna draw some of those hopeful people who believe share our wealth is a, an actual working formulation of taxation as opposed to a fantasy, right? Uh, by the way, the fantasy exists in the fact that the amount of money that Huey was promising was um, impossible to raise from the level of taxation that he's talking about. There simply wasn't enough money uh, being generated by people above $250,000 a year to even fund a remote portion of the promises he was making everybody else, right? So um, aside from the radicalness, right, just on the merits of whether or not that taxation could work at that time, it could not, the math does not compute, right? So that's what Franklin Delano Roosevelt fears. Well, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's political fears are solved by an assassin's bullet. An assassin um, uh, shoots Huey Long in the stomach and he dies uh, from internal bleeding a few days later, right? Um, I know that, that in the world today, things lend themselves to conspiracy theories, but I can assure you um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not have Huey Long killed, right? Huey Long was assassinated because he's Huey Long, which is somewhat of a circular argument, but here's what that means. Huey's political fortunes were created by destroying other people. That's how he raised himself up. He would identify somebody and tear them down as corrupt or working with uh, business or other interests against the common man, against the little guy. And Huey was there to protect the common man, right? So those uh, political practices meant that he destroyed people. He had, as part of his political growth in uh, Louisiana, he had destroyed a backwater uh, parish judge, just some out of the way judge who Huey had uh, labeled or fingered as uh, somebody who was a corrupt uh, and was, um, you know, seeking to work in business interests against the little people. 
Well, this judge whose life was ruined by Huey uh, had a daughter. And this daughter married a, a man who was an Austrian immigrant who had fled Austria because he saw the rise of fascism uh, and uh, feared what it would mean. In Louisiana, this Austrian immigrant saw Huey Long acting in ways that he thought were like the fascists back in Austria, right? And so he took it upon himself to prevent the rise of uh, Huey Long in creating a new, uh, creating a fascist uh, government in the United States. So as Huey exited the Louisiana State House, he shot him in the stomach, right? And then uh, the man, or Huey's bodyguards, riddled him with like 36 bullets, killing the man. Huey reportedly said, um, as he was shot, I wonder why that fellow shot me, right? Because he didn't know this guy from Adam because the son-in-law of a judge he had destroyed. And he may have even been hard pressed to remember this judge whose life and career he had destroyed for his own political purposes, right? So uh, abruptly, Huey is assassinated and removed from any sort of threat. So that means in the 1936 uh, election, the pathway is clear for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he creates this coalition, this juggernaut that steamrolls um, his political opponents, right? The 1936 election is uh, a tremendous vote of support for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, he wins big. Personally, he had a huge electoral uh, or a popular vote total victory. Uh, at the time, it was the highest uh, gap between a winner and a loser. He received, Franklin Delano Roosevelt received 27.4 million votes for re-election as presidency. His uh, opponent, the Republican Alf Landon, former uh, governor of Kansas, by the by, uh, Alf Landon received 16.6 .6 million, right? Franklin Delano Roosevelt not only had a huge electoral victory himself, He's what's known as having very long coattails in politics, which means he swept in with him many Democrats. So many Democrats into the Congress, oh, and not only the United States Congress, but also at the governor and state legislature uh, level. Lots of Democrats were elected, right, in 1936. So in the Congress, the United States Congress, there were so many Democrats that they can't even sit together on the same side of the aisle. They actually have to infiltrate the Republican side so they can have desks and to sit down, right? In the House, there were 333 Democrats and only 80 Republicans. In the Senate, there were 76 Democrats and only 15 Republicans. This is an assertion of um, political power um, that uh, had not been seen since the popularity of George Washington, right? So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is swept to re-election. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt has uh, something that is, um, you can, you tell when somebody has it, and you can also tell when somebody don't, doesn't, right? That's something that amorphous uh, uh, quality is known as power. Franklin Delano Roosevelt has enormous power. Power. His personal um, uh, popularity has been validated by this huge electoral return, right? So he's personally popular. His uh, legislative power is manifested in the fact that the Democrats control overwhelmingly both houses of the Congress or uh, both parts of the Congress, the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. Overwhelmingly Democratic, uh, democratically uh, aligned politicians. Right. Uh, there's also a couple of folks who are from like farmer labor uh, and the progressive party. They vote Democrat, but they're not even technically Democrats. Right. So he has this enormous political power. There's very little opportunity uh, for um, his political opponents to stop him. Right. So he has his own personal popularity in the executive branch. He has uh, enormous uh, clout in the uh, legislative branch. But on the third branch of government, he hasn't done a single thing yet, right? Um, as Jet Siri has told us that in order to get onto the Supreme Court, there's no term limit for people on the Supreme Court. Um, so you have to wait till openings open up. Um, 
at least that's how it's thought, right? So um, this popularity of Franklin Delano Roosevelt has not been reflected in, uh, and control of the legislature has not legislature has not been reflected in the Supreme Court. In fact, Warren G. Harding, uh, in his comparatively short one term, he died of a heart attack in office, has had more impact on the Supreme Court than Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Harding named three people to the Supreme Court, right? So here's Franklin Delano Roosevelt with all this control. The second inaugural address that Franklin Delano Roosevelt issues is an enormously important address. So in his first um, uh, inaugural speech, he talks about this emergency and how he's going to act, right? And the government's going to act, right? So that's what he's signaling. It's an emergency, the government's going to act, right? Inaugural speeches are important because they tell us um, how the, the president sees things and what they are intending to do as part of their next term. So they're, they're setting down markers about what they want to achieve. Second inaugural speech, very another famous uh, speech from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in which, paraphrasing, he says the following things. He says, I see one third of the nation ill housed. I see one third of the nation ill clothed. I see one third of the nation ill educated. And I know we can do better, right? This is signaling a markedly different role for the government because. It is within the realm of normal activities of the government to deal with emergencies, right? So when Franklin Delano Roosevelt is promoting in his first inaugural address, we're going to deal with some emergencies. That that is not you know out of the realm of normal government action, right? Unusual, it's an emergency, right? So it calls for different things, but within the emergency response of the government it is one thing that would not be out of the norm, right? Um, what Franklin Delano Roosevelt is proposing here is that we're not talking about an emergency. If you're ill-educated, it's not an emergency. If you're ill-housed, your house isn't all that great, you're not on the street starving to death. Your citizens on the street starving to death, emergency. People living in not great housing, not an emergency, right? So he's not promoting emergency response. What he's promoting is that the federal government is going to involve itself to help you live better. This is a markedly different role for the government. Ill-educated, we can educate our citizens better and the federal government is going to help them be better educated, right? This is, he's promoting a, a very new pathway, a much more active, much more involved and also go to be consequently much larger uh, federal government and its involvement in individual and corporate life, right? This is what he's promoting. And it's wildly popular. The crowd goes crazy at his inaugural speech. The newspapers are trumpeting how great an idea this is. This is, this is a, a wonderful thing he's proposing, right? And so he gives a speech in January and then people are waiting to see what he's going to do, right? And then he embarks on a surprising turn of events. The first major order of business he does comes like a bolt from the blue. He hasn't had any impact on the Supreme Court. He's still kind of smarting about that nine to zero ruling that threw out the National Industrial Recovery Act. I will tell you that there's a little dispute amongst um, historians who, who study this period. Some historians think that he was angry that the uh, NRA codes were uh, thrown out, and others say he was actually relieved, right? Because the NRA codes weren't working, uh, and it's hard to, you know, unwind this program gracefully. So some historians believe the Supreme Court did him a favor, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt wasn't too unhappy about it. But we do know he was unhappy about the following event, right? So the way the Supreme Court works is the Supreme Court will hear the oral arguments and the justices will ask um, the, the attorneys uh, for both sides who are presenting the case that will ask them sorts of questions. And then that's, that's it for the public face, right? 
things go on behind the scenes. The justices discuss it. They, you know, figure out how they're going to vote, and then they um, pass out uh, the chief justice. The, their job is to pass out who's going to uh, write the ma majority opinion and who's going to write the minority opinion, right? And so, um, if you have uh, a seven to two ruling, somebody from the seven will be uh, chosen to write up the the ruling. And somebody from the two will be right up, uh, will be chosen to write up how, why they voted the other way. Also, each individual justice can write their own explanation. They can write their own ruling justifying uh, why they reached the vote they did, right? So there will be a majority and minority report, right? But any justice can write their own opinion. So the way that the court system works um, in general is um, cases uh, are proposed and they go through uh, the appellate process where there's a ruling at the lowest level and then one side is uh, thinks there's merit to appeal the case and it's picked up by, it goes up to the next court. And so on through this layer of court, federal court system up to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court does not have to hear any case. They choose what cases they're, they want to hear, right? So working its way through the court system uh, doesn't mean if, it, if it's, uh, it stops at the level below the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court decides not to hear it, then that last ruling is the one that is, uh, the one that is, in, um, is in power or in control, right? So the Supreme Court doesn't have to rule on cases, uh, but the Supreme Court uh, looks for cases that test the constitutional issue, uh, especially ones that speak to other uh, similar types of legislation. Supreme Court also has the power to pluck a case anywhere in the process. They can say, we want to hear this one, right? And so they can take it from an appellate court or from even the first level court and say, we're just going to hear it in the Supreme Court, right? So they can uh, speed up the process by uh, taking it right to the court. But in general, these things work through uh, the, the calendar, working their way up through the court system, right? And so we have a case that was part of the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which dealt with uh, minimum wages of some sort. And so the Supreme Court decided to hear this case. So there's oral arguments, uh, and then the Supreme Court uh, issues its ruling. One of the things, many things I admire about the Supreme Court is they operate on their own calendar. Right? They don't much care what other people uh, want or are doing. Uh, I mean, they're somewhat alert to it, but it doesn't, doesn't drive what they do, right? And so when they, decide to issue, what, when they decide a ruling is gonna be issued, it's issued, right? So this Supreme Court ruling came out five to four in which the Supreme Court had invalidated this piece of the Agricultural Adjustment Act, which is from the first hundred days, right? Now, uh, this apparently was the trigger for what Franklin Delano Roosevelt wanted to do, right? And so uh, he abruptly announced that uh, the Supreme Court um, uh, needed more justices, right? The Supreme Court needed more justices because, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, you know, it, it's just not fair, right? We're asking the Supreme Court, comma, which is filled with a bunch of justices over the age of 65, comma, to do so much work that it's not fair to them, right? So what I, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, am proposing is that we're going, for every justice over the age of 65, we're gonna add a new justice. And this new justice will help share the burden of the, the monumental number of cases that the Supreme Court has to deal with, right? So that's how he phrases it. Well, that's not really what this is about, right? What this is really about is that Franklin Delano Roosevelt is unhappy that the Supreme Court is ruling against legislation that he has helped pass, uh, pass and he hasn't had a say who's on the Supreme Court, right? So he's afraid this court which skews much more conservative than um, the legislature, the public, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt, 
is going to undo all this legislation of the New Deal, right? That's part of it. But the bigger fear for Franklin Delano Roosevelt is they're ruling on this 100 days legislation, which is not terribly radical, and they're ruling it out, right? So Franklin Delano Roosevelt is afraid they're going to throw out his more radical legislation of the second 100 days. And most of all, he's afraid they're going to throw out Social Security, right? So Franklin Delano Roosevelt takes this abrupt action, right? Uh, and uh, he promotes it as, you know, he's just going to help these uh, older justices, right? There's this, this is a transparent attempt to put a positive cast on what he wants to do. He wants to reshape the court to be more in line with him politically by adding new justices. It becomes known as court packing, right? Because critics say he's trying to pack the Supreme Court with his supporters, uh, watering down the independence of the Supreme Court. Now, Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, knows that the Supreme Court total of nine is not written into the Constitution. Constitution says there will be a Supreme Court. And during the 19th century, the number of people on the Supreme Court has fluctuated, right? But since uh, 1863, the Supreme Court has been made up of nine members, right? Or that was the last time new members were added, right? So uh, the Supreme Court, uh, it's number of nine has been that way for a, a while, even though it's not written into the Constitution. So Franklin Delano Roosevelt knows he's not violating the Constitution to add new justices, but he didn't do a, a, of his due diligence on, on tracking how these things would work out. First, his charge is that the Supreme Court is uh, too old and slow to deal with all the new uh, issues before it, right? Well, the Chief Justice shoots back, uh, the Supreme Court not only is dealing with more cases than any Supreme Court has in the history of the United States, it is dealing with them faster than any Supreme Court uh, in the United States history. So he says, we don't need to help. Thanks for the offer. We don't need the additional justices. We're doing just fine, right? So he hasn't uh, plotted out uh, the response of the Supreme Court. They're not going to be too keen on this, and they have a, the evidence to show that they're not holding things up. Second, um, there is the issue of um, how this is going to be passed, right? He is promoting the idea that the people in the Supreme Court are over age 65 and can't do the job. In order to get this done, he has to go through the United States Senate which is full of people over the age of 65, right? So the argument that people over the age of 65 can't do their job, he has to get the United States Senate, which is full of people over the age of 65, um, to say, yeah, those people over the age of 65 in the Supreme Court can't do their job. Here in the legislature, we're all sharp as tack, right? So he's promoting it to an audience that isn't uh, really keen on the argument that he's using to justify it. The biggest thing, and this is something that Luchenberg is quite distraught about, is that this effort was completely unnecessary because Franklin Delano Roosevelt didn't pay close enough attention to what the court was telling him. In the case that ruled, that set Roosevelt off, this five to four ruling, the swing justice was a justice by the name of Owen Roberts. And Owen Roberts voted with the majority to rule that piece of legislation unconstitutional. But he was very careful to explain why he voted the way he did. And to boil it down, he said, I recognize that in these unusual circumstances, unusual actions will be required. And so I'm willing to give the executive and legislative branch great leeway in constructing legislation to deal with this emergency, this economic emergency. However, this particular bill does not pass muster, right? So he's signaling that I'm not opposed to the idea of these novel actions. And I, I agree that the government needs to act 
in ways that may be stretching the Constitution in these desperate times. I'm just saying this one doesn't doesn't cut it. So write a better bill, and I'll vote. I'll I'll, I'll declare it constitutional, right? So that he took great pains to signal that. And on top of that, the, you know, the Supreme Court hears the cases, they make their decisions, and then they issue their rulings. So during this whole discussion uh, about this idea of adding new justices, this, a new Supreme Court ruling came down the pike. And the new Supreme Court ruling said um, the issue of um, this constitutionality of an unusual action is validated. The court ruled five to, fa five to four in favor of a piece of legislation that was part of the New Deal that was stretching the roles, right? And Owen Roberts was in the five that declared it constitutional. So um, he didn't have to pursue this effort, right? Which was a losing political effort, right? That's what makes Luchenberg distraught is that he didn't um, pay close enough attention to it. Finally, this effort was unnecessary because over the next two and a half years, Franklin Delano Roosevelt named five Supreme Court justices, right? Not by adding, not by packing the court, but the old fashioned way. The justices died or retired. And so Franklin Delano Roosevelt was able to shape the court over the next two and a half years by naming five justices in and of itself a majority on the nine, right? So that was unnecessary. And Luchenberg is distraught because this effort cost Franklin Delano Roosevelt that amorphous quality, political power, right? Uh, the Senate ultimately gave him a face-saving uh, way out of it. And what they did was they allowed him to name some justices at the lower level, not the Supreme Court. Right. Supreme Court didn't change, but it cost political capital for Franklin Delano Roosevelt in Congress, but it also cost him public relations support. Right. This effort was deeply unpopular with the public. And the more that Franklin Delano Roosevelt pursued it, the more it validated his then small in number, but beginning to grow critics who said he's acting like a dictator. Right. Second thing occurs at the start of his second um, uh, term that undercuts his political support and his political popularity. Um, the uh, economy, which had begin was beginning to grow, suddenly took a plunge. And so now the economic downturn in this summer of uh, late spring, summer of 1937, uh, is, uh, you know, you can't really say it's the Republicans' fault anymore because you, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and Democrats have been in control now uh, for uh, coming up on five years, right? So you can't really blame the Republicans anymore. So the continuing uh, struggles of the economy are now being blamed on the Democrats, right? And people are, are um, you know, frightened that the economy has tanked again, and they're blaming the people in power, the Democrats, right? Third, the, uh, the support for uh, industrial unions, this unionization effort that workers have the right to form unions is leading to union efforts to expand their membership and to get uh, uh, the things they want. And so unions hit upon a new tactic or it was a new tactic at the time. Instead of going out front and picketing and prevent people from going in to use the factory or mine or whatever, right, which has been the traditional practice, workers are adopting or adopting the widespread a new tactic known as a sit down strike. And a sit down strike is where the workers sit down inside the factory and say, we're not working. And that way they can prevent anybody from coming in. <coughs> So there's a big unionization effort at one of the biggest uh, groups who've been opposed to unions, automobile manufacturing. The other big one is steel, right? Two of the largest uh, industries that have uh, been uh, sharply resistant to the workers trying to form unions in their factories, right? Uh, employing all the tactics to prevent that from occurring. So uh, there's a, a, a plant known as the Fisher Auto Body Plant, which is in Flint, Michigan. 
And Fisher Auto Body creates the chassis of, um, of the vehicles that GM makes, right? And that auto body uh, plant produces the chassis for a variety of different vehicles that are made at other uh, factories. So it's a particularly useful choke point, right? Because GM is relying on the chassis coming out of this Fisher auto body plant. When the workers sit down inside, the, the company is, uh, is in a tough place, right? Because the workers are inside the building, they can't bring in scab laborers. Because the workers are inside the building, uh, the, you know, the indirect uh, threat is that if you try and evict us, well, expensive pieces of machinery may get broken, right? So there's that threat. Uh, and because the workers are inside the building, it's hard to, for the police to try and evict them. So when GM goes to the police to help evict them, the police uh, try and come into the factory and the workers drive them back out by hucking stuff at them. Um, tools, uh, the parts of the car, door hinges, the heavy hinges that hold the door on were things. And so it's called the Battle of Bulls Run, where the police came in and were they driven out. Right, so the police can evict uh, them. So uh, the workers are occupying the building, and so GM goes as it always does to the next level. It goes to the governor of Michigan. Well, this is a different world now. So now, not only have we had the Wagner Labor Act, which says workers have the right um, uh, to unionize, we've also had politics that more radicals have been elected. And the governor of Mich Michigan not only says, "I'm not going to help." you GM evict these strikers, he said, I'm likely to go down there and help join the city, right? So the political world has changed. And so faced with this new reality, GM uh, capitulates. They agree to recognize the, the workers to form a collective and then negotiate with them, right? And uh, in short order, the other automobile factories do as well, right? Although Ford held out for the longest time. Uh, in the steel industry, the mere threat of a sit-down strike led steel to uh, recognize the rights of workers' unions, right? So this is a tremendous change in the uh, uh, rights of workers to unionize that is now creating these large industrial unions, right? But this is unpopular with the nation's middle class because the way they see it, these radical workers are stealing the property of factory owners, right? By sitting in the factory, they're preventing the factory owners from using their property. And they say, if the government allows them to do that to GM, right? What's going to stop them from uh, my workers trying to uh, demand things from me by occupying my dry cleaner shop, right? So the combination of these three things in the summer of 1937, the uh, unpopular court packing scheme, the, the economic downturn, and the fears of the middle class of radical action that the workers are uh, uh, forming leads to uh, a lessening of political support for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it also creates a coalition of opponents in the Congress. Republicans, who are small in number, find common cause with conservative Democrats conservative Democrats from the South. They're members of the Democratic Party, but they're much more conservative and fearful of the radical action as they see it that Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the rest of the Democratic Party is taking. And so they begin to unify to try and block Franklin Delano Roosevelt's plans. All right, so uh, Wednesday we'll talk about uh, events related to World War II, uh, and then we will uh, start the Gaddis book uh, next week, we'll do the civil rights uh, material on Monday, and then on Wednesday, I'll finish up Gaddis. All right, so keep up with the syllabus, and I will see you all next week.